Thank you very much for listening to Switched On. I'm absolutely honoured to be joined um, by today um, by a very special guest, uh, trailblazing, pioneering astrophysicist. Uh, but I'm Professor Dame Susan Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for joining me today. Thank you. Good to be with you. Yeah, it's excellent, Professor. Um, I, as, as I said to you before on this podcast, you know, I. I um, I have people from many different industries and, and discuss certain things and astrophysics are, and the universe, et cetera, are one of them things that absolutely fascinates me. And um, some of the things that I, I find um, just beyond comprehension uh, and we'll mm. delve into that. Um, but I obviously picked up on, on yourself and, and, and done a hell of a lot of reading about you and obviously your discoveries, um, which is in incredible. Um, but obviously um, you discovered the pulsar star and I wanted to establish um, yourself and, and growing up um, initially, um, yourself, obviously, you, you, uh, you got your degree at Glasgow University and then you went on to Cambridge to your PhD. And I know I read upon you about being a young woman um, at that time in the 60s um, and, and being involved in astrophysics at that time, being part of the, was it part of like a patriarchy, male dominated? What was it like? Um, growing up in, in, in that type of industry and building yourself up? And what was the surroundings like? Um, um, especially, I know I read somewhere that you obviously uh, had like an imposter syndrome at Cambridge also, mm. um, because you felt intimidated um, because of this sort of male dominated um, uh, science that you, you was delving into. Yeah, yes, I, I learned quite early on that not many girls did science. Indeed, the secondary school I started in automatically sent girls to the domestic science room and the boys to the science classroom. So we were gender divided. Um, I had been promised I'd get to do science in secondary school, so I was quite upset, but uh, the cookery teacher wasn't hearing anything about it. However, when I told my parents that evening, they hit the roof and phoned the head teacher and said they wanted their daughter to do science. Thank you very much. It turned out that the local GP had a, doc had a daughter in my class as well. And he similarly and independently phoned the head teacher and said, I want my daughter to do science. And next time the science class met, there were three girls and all the boys. And I don't think that teacher had ever taught girls before. I think he regarded us as dangerous, as dynamite. He made us sit right up against his desk at the front of the class. Uh, but I liked the science. I was good at it. In fact, I came top of the class at the end of that first term. And I don't remember the teacher praising me. I do remember him berating the boys for allowing a girl to beat them all and how they had to work a lot harder. <laughs> wow. wow. So from quite early on, I knew I wasn't um, doing the normal thing. Because <laughs> mm, mm. I was good at it. <laughs> yeah. And obviously at that time it was, yeah, the sort of male dominated industries, the male obviously with women and, and men in education system, and uh, the 2.4 children, the, the woman stays at home and, and yeah. the man goes to work and provides. Um, yeah. And so it went on from there to, to do your degree at Glasgow um, to yeah. study astrophysics. What was what made you delve into that? Just your development of sciences at secondary school. And then you said, well, I'm going to do a degree. Mm. Um, as I said, I discovered quite early on that I was good at science, especially good at physics. Uh, and I like physics. And uh, as I went through secondary school, I was thinking, well, I think I'm going to be a physicist of some sort. But if you do a physics degree, there are many, many different things you can do. All the way from medical physics in a hospital, you know, through making these little transistor type devices that behind all the electronics we do um, to, to astrophysics. And I was wondering, what kind of physics am I going to do ultimately? What grabs me? And I became hooked on astrophysics or astronomy and thought, right, that's what I'd really like to do if I can. I'll do a 
standard physics degree to begin with, and then I'd become an astronomer, an astrophysicist. And I was lucky enough to get to do it. Wow, wow, that's great. Um, so obviously then you, you, you attain your degree um, and then it went on to, to get your PhD at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. What yeah. was that like first starting out there? Because you were a junior and your assistant, and obviously we'll get onto your discoveries at a very young age as well, which is incredible. Um, but what was that like starting out Cambridge? Because obviously, as I said at the start, you felt like you, you had a, a bit of imposter, imposter syndrome, like you didn't belong. Yeah, that's right. Well, at that time in Cambridge, there were very few places for women. Um, probably only about two or three women to every dozen men, something like that. So there were very, very few women. Um, we had to behave ourselves exceptionally well so as not to have people say, oh, trust a woman, we'll never have any more women, send them all away. You know, we were in a sense pioneering, um, making places for more women in Cambridge. Um, it's now equaled up, of course, and, and I don't know the exact details, but it's broadly 50-50 male mm. students in Cambridge. So there are lots of women, but very, very few then. And, and we were under instructions to be very proper, very well behaved. Um, and until then, I had never been in the south of England. I had been in the north of England, the Northern Ireland, Scotland, but never that far south. And I fun suddenly found myself in an environment where there were a number of men from public schools, you know, the Eatons and the Harrows of this world, um, young men who felt that they were totally brilliant and were absolutely entitled to a place in Cambridge. And I didn't fit that mould, either by background or by gender, and was clearly an outsider. And to a degree, I think there. I felt I was there on sufferance. Mm. I not only had to behave myself, I had to do very well academically. And I decided that uh, they probably had made a mistake admitting me. I really was an outsider. They'd probably discover their mistake and they'd send me away. But until then, I was going to work my very hardest so that when they sent me away, I'd know I'd done the best I could. Mm. We have a name for this attitude now. It's called imposter syndrome. Um, men and women can suffer from it. Maybe they find themselves in a new job and they think, ah, I'm not up to this. They've made a mistake recruiting me. They're going to sack me. Yeah. <laughs> they aren't. But uh, for anybody who feels that, my advice is to work as hard as you can, do the best work you can. So that when they discover they've made a mistake and sack you, you'll know you've done your best. Mm. And actually, they'll probably discover they've got a jolly good employee and they won't sack you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good point, because obviously there is an element of, of, of taking on more than you can take on as, as, a, as a person. But that's all part of self-development, isn't it? You've got to be prepared to, to put yourself in that environment. But obviously, if you're going into an industry where you, you knew nothing about and just chucking yourself in the deep end that you know nothing about, that's different. But obviously, if you know about it and you throw yourself in, you are going to develop as a person and get used to it, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of people feel that imposter syndrome. Mm. I told Joseph that it particularly affects those in, in sort of journalism industry. You're only as good as your last piece, people mm. feel. Mm. But yeah, you've got to take some risks in this life. And that, I think, is one of the risks you have to take if you're going to do anything. I mean, OK, if you want to shelter in the cupboard at home the whole time, that's up to you. But it's better to go out there and take a bit of risk mm. and develop. And then you'd be able to take on a bit more risk and develop a bit more and have interesting life. 100% agree with you, Professor. It's all incremental, isn't it? It's about self-development. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden that, that, that what you thought was a lot of pressure on you then becomes easy and then you move on a step and, move, and that's how it, how it works, doesn't it? I completely yeah, agree that's with you. Right. Each responsible for our own development in the, in the last analysis. So it's mm. up to us to push ourselves a bit. Great advice, great advice, completely agree. So, Professor, you are now a young assistant, you're, you're working for your PhD in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and 
you uh, I th- I was it around 23 years old you was put in charge of um, was it an observation of, uh, of a telescope and you was uh, looking at these erratic um, radio waves would you refer to as green men forgive me if I'm jumping ahead or um, and it was your um, you, your job to actually notice this and you started noticing this uh, sort of inconsistent radio wave um, do, do you want to take it from there sorry if I've, I've, I've got that incorrect no, that, that's fine. Um, I helped build a radio telescope. It took two years of fairly heavy manual labor. And then when it was built, I was the person in charge of operating it. And I was still being very conscientious and I was checking out every curious signal from this telescope to make sure I understood, and make sure it was operating properly. And I stumbled across this little signal um, very, very small signal in amongst a lot of other stuff. But because I was being particularly thorough, I decided to check it out. And it turned out to be a totally unexpected type of star, which we now call a pulsar. And the name has passed into public use as well. It's not just a scientific term anymore, but it was initially an abbreviation of pulsating radio star, because there was this star-like thing out there in space that was sending out pulses so pulsating radio star <laughs> mm. and so when was it your your um, um you were an assistant so was it anthony hennish was the the chaps hewish. hewish sorry um mm-hmm. and you you've made these discoveries and and obviously mm-hmm. you put it to him um and when when was it sort of when you discovered this, it was actually so incredible that you discovered this new, new that you discovered the pulsar star. When did it actually start to materialize how incredible this was? Or was it over a period of time? Um, yes, these, these things do take time. Um, I was uh, what's called a graduate student. I'd done my first degree and I was working for a higher degree, which gives me the title of doctor. And Tony Hewish was my advisor. Uh, And it's like a big research project that takes three years. And your research report is a book, you know, not just five pages that you might have for a a lesser research project. Mm. It's a big thing. Um, And the bulk of it was on the topic that was meant to be my research project. These these pulsars went in a chapter at the end of the the thesis. (laughs) Wow. All these discovery things are processes. You know, you you find something funny, you check that maybe you've seen it before or you haven't seen it before. And then you try and get a bit more information about it. You study it in a slightly different way and you go on and you go on and you go on. It's quite a slow process. Um, So it all happened within a year, which is actually quite fast, but it did happen within a year. And um just trying to remember the timetable within the year and i'm not sure i can but uh, i i noticed there was this funny signal and my tony Th- hewish my thesis advisor suggested i look into it in a bit more detail and the flipping thing had gone away disappeared it wasn't whatever it was it had gone silent and of course everything's the student's fault so you know, my thesis, thesis advisor, Tony, was blaming me for the fact it had gone away. <laughs> and then you get it and it's incredible and he doesn't believe you. So he comes and he stands looking over your shoulder and sees it with his own eyes. You know, and it goes on like that. And it's really quite a stretched out process. Um, for me, actually, a very important point was finding a second one of these. As long as you've only got one of something, it's uh, you're not quite sure what what's going on. But once you get two, and then I found three and four, um, so this is a new population of something, and I've just hit the top of the iceberg to mix the metaphor. <laughs> mm. uh, we now know of thousands of these objects. Incidentally, they're called pulsars, but I found the first four, wow. and it was huge fun. <laughs> so. Obviously, this incredible discovery um, obviously then materialized into the the Nobel Prize. 
um, mm -hmm. uh, obviously a Nobel Prize winner. Um, but obviously, you being a, a young uh, student at the time, uh, assistant mm -hmm. going for your further de degree, um, you didn't, uh, you weren't able to claim that award. That was from your senior, even though you made the discovery. How did that feel when that materialized? I, I read obviously somewhere that then once the, uh, you made this discovery, it was sort of out of your hands and then um, your, your senior, Mr. Hewish, um, then wasn't inviting you to meetings and things didn't, um, and they were sort of cutting you out. Was that the way it was going, going down? Well, the Nobel Prize you don't apply for. Um, there's a committee in Stockholm um, this is the Nobel Physics Prize we're talking about. So it's a committee of physicists, probably about 20 men and one woman, knowing the gender balance in physics at that time. <laughs> and each year they have the responsibility of selecting one or two people who get the Nobel Physics Prize. There's no Nobel Prize in astronomy. Um, there's no Nobel Prize in mathematics. You know, Nobel, Mr. Nobel was fairly specific about the areas he gave for prizes. And until then, the physics committee had never considered astronomy or astrophysics as producing the same quality of results as you know they, they saw within mainstream physics. Um, so that particular Nobel Prize was the very first time that the physics committee had recognized there was good physics in astronomy. And it was a hugely important precedent. And I, I knew that the instant the prize was announced, because I knew that in future years, other astronomers would get the Nobel Prize. And since then, probably about 20 other astronomers have had the Nobel Physics Prize. So I, you know, I was right in that instinct, um, right in recognizing how important that step was. And that was the thing that was really most important to me, that astronomy was getting proper recognition. So how did, but obviously you made the discovery and, and it, um, it's very noble of you, obviously, to not, um, not sort of take it on and, and, and get involved in it. But at the end of the day, that was your discovery and your senior did take, um, take the, uh, he took that and, and claimed the prize for it. But at the time, do you remember how that made you feel? I mean, that must have made you feel, I, I don't know, was you, was you angry? No, I was hugely pleased for the reasons I've just said. I yeah. recognize what an important precedent was created by that. Mm. So I, I, you know, I think my colleagues were expecting me to be angry, but I wasn't. Um, my colleagues labeled it not the Nobel Prize, but the No hyphen Bell Prize, <laughs> because I was still unmarried at that stage. And so my surname was Bell. So it became known amongst the student community as the Nobel Prize. Um, but the only people you can blame for that, if anybody is to be blamed, is the committee that made the selection. You don't apply for this prize. Right. It lands on you, <laughs> so <Right>. to speak. <laughs> I see. I see. So your senior at the time then, he wasn't, it wasn't really, he, he couldn't, he, it wasn't his fault as such, and um, they'd obviously no. nominated him. But um, still, uh, you would have thought that there may have been some consideration there on his part to uh, to include you in that. But, uh, but well, the, I'm not sure that he had the power to. You know, the the Nobel Prize Committee says this, and uh, it, it's you know awarded by the king, and <laughs> you don't have. To. <laughs> I see. I see. Um, but going back on to discovery, Professor. Um, yeah. that's used now, isn't it? These, the, the pulses as radio waves in modern astrophysics as measurements, isn't it? Um, and the way that yeah. they're used now, it's just an incredible um, legacy to have. Yeah. They turn out to be very reliable. They, they pulse very reliably. They're good clocks. Mm. And that means we can use, it means that nature's provided us clocks dotted throughout the universe which enables us to do a number of basic physics tests, checking out some of Einstein's stuff. Mm. Also incidentally means that when we travel through the galaxy in spaceships, which of course is not tomorrow, but when we travel through the galaxy in spaceships, 
we can use these stars a bit like navigators use lighthouses. Mm. Give us bearings on where we are to help us navigate. But that's a bit in the future. <laughs> I was going to jump onto that, actually, with you, Professor, and just the evolution of astrophysics. And obviously, mm -hmm. in a short space of time, what we've had, you know, you can go back 500 years to Galileo, um, and then as we've had um, the evolution of it, and what we discover, how do you, this is where my mind goes on overdrive, just to discover traveling through space uh, and what we will be able to travel or where we will be able to travel in the concept of time and distance. Where can you see us going in regards to that? Uh, I mean, do you believe that we'll be able to get, conveniently travel to, to distant um, solar systems and, and things like that? Uh, I mean, the, the actual... Mm, not, not in the near future, no. Um, it, it's quite fun to think about traveling through space but you know we're even struggling to get to mars at the moment mm. and that's very very local by astronomical standards um so i wouldn't bank on being able to travel very far in the foreseeable future it'll probably come one day but what we are able to do more and more is make more sophisticated observations from here on earth or from satellites going around the the earth and get a lot more information about stars and galaxies and black holes and pulsars and what have you out there in space. And the, the discovery of these different planets and looking back, obviously, billions of light years away and what they can see now from distant telescopes and light. Um, again, the, the comprehension of that um, I'm reading somewhere where they can actually see back in time of, of the light of, of the Big Bang and yeah. things like that. Yeah. I, I mean, yes. that's just incredible. How it do they, how, how, how can they do that? Um, by, by choosing the, the quotes, color of light you use, um, although it's not actually light, it's microwaves. Um, just a, a brief reminder that along with light, there are things like radio waves that we're using and x-rays and gamma rays and infrared and ultraviolet they're all part of a continuous spectrum uh, and that's a spectrum that we've gradually come to understand over the last couple of hundred years we are very familiar with light we've come pretty familiar with radio waves um, not least you know through internet and, and zoom and uh, all the things we've done during lockdowns but stars and galaxies give out all these different kinds of radiations. And by choosing which radiation you study things with, you can learn quite a lot more and quite a lot of different things. And that's, for instance, how we've learned about the Big Bang and the heat left over from the Big Bang. And, you know, the, the early, early days of the universe. We've still not totally cracked it, but uh, we're, we're gaining a lot of understanding there and a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah, the, the discovery of the, the Big Bang, and I've, I've listened to podcasts on it, and mm. then your mind starts opening up, and we're starting to see now in, in, in journalism in the United States come out about, you know, these UFO objects and, and everything like that, 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 that are unidentified, unhumanly, and moving not in the, the, the gravitational force that we have, um, and that's been released. So if... I wanted to ask you that, and it's obviously based on theory. Um, but is is that capable? Do you believe that there is um, non-human life here on Earth? Do you believe that? And if so, you know, when they've they've found the, the, these uh, nanotechnologies or, um, that the the Air Force have, have located on on CCTV um, that are moving around, that are, uh, they're claiming that are not. As I, as I just said, humanly possible to design. If that is true, and I, I referred back to uh, Galileo and our, 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 our 500 odd years of, of science um, and yeah. evolution, yeah. is it possible that there's an, another planet from another galaxy, another solar, well, I'd say another galaxy, that the, the sciences of, of uh, the evolution of their science could have gone on for millions of years and they could be able to to travel and you know you can see where i'm going with this just completely yeah. mind-boggling stuff but i'm very interested in what you believe um in 
uh, in regards to alien life here and capabilities? Mm. I'm cautious. Um, the science tells me that the distances are vast. It takes very long time simply to travel these distances. Um, so I think it's actually unlikely that we have any aliens amongst us that they've visited Earth. Uh, I think we will ultimately come up with some more terrestrial explanation for the, the things that are seen. Um, I also think that there'll always be people here on Earth who believe in UFOs or little green men or what have you. So that's not going to go away either. So there'll always be this kind of conversation. But I still personally don't believe that it's scientifically reliable, accurate, sound, possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I interviewed previously a, um, a chap um, that worked for the Ministry of Defence, um, and he part of his remit was UFOs and that discovery and things like that. And he was very exactly the same as you, really, just mm -hmm. very cautious. Yeah. Um, usually things have a, a, an explanation when they when you look into it more yeah. um, intensely but yes. moving back to the evolution again of astrophysics so you know we're struggling to get to mars you've seen elon musk now and um and and they're developing uh, vessels that go to, to mars do you think that we'll be able to um be able to man or visit any other planets further than that in a, such a short space of time? Because let's think that, you know, when was it that we didn't think, it was only a few decades ago that we didn't think there was anything past our own solar system, did we? I mean, that's how- Oh, oh no, 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 no. Um, since about, you know, we, we've known about stuff beyond our solar system for a long, 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 long time. Long, long time. Yep. Um, it's only fairly recently that we've been made able to find planets around other stars. Um, so just like the sun has the planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, da, 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 da. There are other stars with planets around them as well. And uh, right at the moment, actually, we're finding a lot of those. The, the technology has got to the point where we can now much more easily discover planets around other stars. And we now know of probably about 4,000 planets around other stars. So if you look up at the night sky on a clear night, um, unless you're in the middle of a city, you'll be seeing four or 5,000 stars. And you should say to yourself, there's as many planets up there as there are stars, as I can see. Now, some of those planets will be very close to their sun and uncomfortably hot. Some will be very far from their sun and uncomfortably cold. But unless there was something unique about the creation of life on Earth, I would imagine that there is life or has been or will be life elsewhere in the universe. The chances of making contact with it are microscopic, really? <laughs> at least at the moment. So whilst I, I would not be surprised to learn that there is life elsewhere in the universe, I think the chances of talking with them, <laughs> let alone meeting them, are really, really remote. Yeah, and it, it really, you know when people talk about the the, the planets up in the sky and, and what we are in earth in amongst that we're, we're like a grain of sand or a fifth, mm. of, a pin, fifth of a pinhead um yep. in in a huge vast um galaxy of stars it's just it's just incredible and you going back to what you were saying that the the planets obviously earth is a certain distance from the sun which is obviously enabled to with the gases formed the label to inhabit life yeah. there, there's many of them planets that have been discovered then have already that they're earth-like planets positioned from their sun then we do we know we don't know there's human life on there or we do or it's just no, com com no. confirmation at the moment there's no confirmation of life anywhere else um, we're gradually finding planets that might be habitable. Um, so far, I think there aren't many candidates, but you know that the number of candidates will build up. And uh, I think one thing you might do is look at, when you get good enough equipment, look at the atmosphere of those distant planets and say, is that atmosphere out of chemical balance? 
because if there were some life on that planet, it could affect the atmosphere and make the atmosphere out of chemical balance. Mm. So one day, um, not in my lifetime, I expect, we will be able to look at the atmospheres of some of these planets around other stars and say, yes, that atmosphere is interesting. Mm. There might be some kind of organic life on that planet. And yet there might be some sort of organic life, but the possibilities and the comprehension of traveling distances, <laughs> that was completely impossible and against our, 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 our own law and sciences itself, isn't it? It's certainly extremely, extremely difficult. I would hesitate to use the word impossible, but you've got tremendous social issues because the journey would take a long time and there will be people who are born, live and die on the spaceship, on the journey. Um, and how humanity organizes that kind of thing. I mean, look, we didn't organize a pandemic very well, did we? How, how can you organize that kind of thing and have people well and healthy? And the people who reach the, the new planet have never lived on old planet Earth. Lots and lots of social issues amongst everything else. Mm -hmm. Interesting, but not in our lifetime, I think. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. As no. <laughs> with, with sciences and how and how that's changed, obviously the, the fundamentals of astrophysics and what you've discovered in a, such a short space of time of discoveries that you've experienced, do you find that the, the fundamentals that you've learned previously have completely changed? Or, you know, you look into things that you to say, well, we 20 years ago or 30 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, we didn't even think that that was possible. But now we're looking at things to say, well, it is. It's partly because our technologies have improved. You know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we didn't have transistors. We didn't have any microelectronics or circuit boards or things like that. Um, and so the discoveries that the physicists make lead to major technological changes, which lead to major opportunities. Mm. Slow process, we're talking decades for all that, but we are gradually getting cleverer in terms of what we can do technologically. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, just, just looking up here, you know, I look up at the sky, I'm obviously um, very keen on, on looking to, one of my favourite podcasts is in astrophysics, it's looking to astrophysics and, and discovery of black holes and, 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 and things like that. We, we just um, made a, a discovery recently where the, the, the picture of a black hole, wasn't it, that recently come out. Right. Um, and tell me about them, their capabilities, and obviously um, the capabilities will suck everything in. Um, and and I, now I was reading somewhere that they're uh, able to possibly from this discovery uh, look at extraterrestrial life or different um, different life forms on different galaxies, etc. Um, is there any truth in that? The technology is steadily improving. Um, they couldn't have done that black hole image um, 10 years ago. Mm. They, they, <laughs> they struggle to do it even now. You know, it really was stretching the technology hugely. Um, and they're getting better at it because there's been a revised image more recently, for instance. Um, so it gets better all the time. But I think I, what I really want to emphasize is the hard graft that has to go in to make these technological improvements. It doesn't just happen because somebody says, oh, I'll invent a Fujimi flip. Mm. You know, it, it, it's really, really very hard, dedicated work, steady improvement with luck. Um, needing quite a lot of funding, of course, to, to do these little improvements step by step. And it does depend on government funding scientists to do research that doesn't have an immediate obvious pot of gold at the end, but which we know from experience that the, the technological improvements will feed into something else, which will feed into something else, which will feed into spaceships to go to Mars or, mm. you know, better replacements for my arthritic hip. Who knows? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, well, yes, it's uh, it is true, isn't it? Our our things, it's just contribution over time, isn't it? And expertise. Mm. Um, yeah. What was? What's your whole? I was asked you this: your your whole experience of being an astrophysicist and how your and how your your career has obviously gone on from uh, where it is now. What what is your experience of it as a whole? Um, and and what would you say to any young astrophysicist now in regards to ethics, work ethics, and because I, I can imagine it's an extremely difficult, tiring um, uh, job to do. I would think it it's probably no more tiring than any other job done conscientiously, to be honest. Um, I think the most important thing is for people to discover what their talents are, because we all have talents in some areas. Um, none of us have talents in every area. Um, you know, every school kid knows that they're dreadful at French, but good at something else, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so it's partly a case of discovering what your particular skills and talents are and then trying to find a role, a job in life where you can make good use of your best talents. Um, mm. And that's actually, I think, quite difficult. You're coping with a lot of things as a teenager, as it is, um, without trying to perceive what your, your strengths are. So... Yeah, but society, I think, will continue to get better at things and we'll make more inventions and improvements and hopefully life will get better gradually for everybody mm. and just, you know, the rich and highly educated, but everybody. Mm, mm, I completely agree hopefully and it, it obviously you made a great point in in society now and how it's changed obviously with social media and young students and uh, young men and women and what they have to deal with now it's so complex mm -hmm. and obviously growing up is a lot more difficult I believe anyway you've got a lot of things going on well I mean it's been an absolute joy to speak with you professor thank you so much um for coming on and honestly it's opened my mind but it's just i find now people are a lot more interested in this subject have you found that the public now a lot more uh, involved with um what what uh, I'm, I'm trying to comprehend what is around us um, um, yeah. um uh, who our neighbors are and how vast this galaxy is or universe is do you find it's got a lot more of attention as um, in the last 20 years or i suspect it has there certainly are a lot of amateur astronomical societies you know every major city will have its astronomical society or space and astronomy society uh, meetings of people who are interested in space space travel astronomy galaxies and so on um it seems to me there are a lot of those uh, okay during lockdown it's been different but um normally um there are a lot of astronomy societies where people with interests in this topic um mm. meet. and the other thing that's happening is that there's quite a bit of stuff online as well um and including opportunities for those who are interested in doing a bit of science themselves to help professional scientists who are drowning in the amount of data they have and need the help from other people to go sifting through the data. Um, citizen science projects, these are called, you find them online. And it might be anything from doing a survey of all the trees in Britain. You know, please could you help by surveying the trees in your neighborhood go and measure them and enter the measurements online to astronomy and space projects where somebody has so many pictures of the sky that they just can't cope. And so they put the pictures online, provide a little bit of tutorial for anybody who's interested and say, you know, please look at these pictures and see if you can see this kind of thing that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Lots um, of opportunities online to be scientists. There you go. Uh, anyone listening in and take that advice if you if you're interested in it um professor thank you so much for coming on my pleasure thank you joseph thank you you thank take you. care thank you. um you too professor dame jocelyn uh, susan jocelyn bell been an absolute honor thank you thank you very much Cheers. goodbye bye, -bye.